Edward, I, I hear from people all the time who are confused as to how uh, the financial system here in America has became become such an absolute train wreck. And there's a lot of people, Tea Party movement uh, and other types of, of people who are claiming that if we return to the founding principles as set forth by our America's founding fathers, uh, you know, that could be a solution. You know, but many people don't think about the economic foundation that our nation had. Do us a favor, take us back in time to early America, to the founding, and based upon your research, what would America's founding fathers say were the real root causes of our current economic crisis? Well, I think that there's no question of uh, the answer to that. Uh, they would say that the root cause of our economic crisis today is is fiat money. It is money that is not backed by gold or silver. You see, there's a part of this history we were just talking about a moment ago that people either forgot or never knew in the first place. And that is that the early experience of the colonies was an economic disaster. The uh, first place in the world that money, paper money, was printed on a printing press without any gold or silver behind it was in the colonies. It was in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. The first example of, of paper money was in ancient China. It wasn't really paper. It was, it was this, the bast from the inside of the bark of a tree, but it looked very much like paper. They printed it, and that was the first experience of uh, what we'll call paper money. And the second one was in Massachusetts, of all places, shortly after the printing press was perfected. And it was so successful there, the, the, uh, the fathers of Massachusetts were printing up money all over the place and, and buying uh, services with it. And it was so uh, uh, successful to the politicians that soon all of the other colonies were out there buying their own printing presses and doing the same thing. And the colonies were awash with paper money, and it destroyed the economic system here. People lost everything because the value of the money kept going down, down, down as the quantity went up, up, up. And by the time the Revolutionary War came along, then more of that went on in order to pay for the war. And the uh, Continental Congress had developed its own money. They called the Continental. They printed up millions and millions and millions of, of dollars all of which started out to be, by the way, when, uh, the, when the Continental was first printed, the paper Continental, it, by mandate, it was one Continental equals um, one ounce of gold. Two years later, they were worth two cents. It took a million dollars to buy a suit of clothes. Wow. And this is the experience that America went through, and it was devastating. And so when it came time at the end of the Revolution to write that Constitution, they, those founding fathers were very, very clear. We were never going to do that again. And they wrote the Constitution in such clear words that, you know, no state shall issue anything but coin uh, as, as money. Silver and gold, coin, no paper money, no credits, no debts, just coin. And they made that clear. <laughs> well, so that was it. They understood it, but then, of course came time for them to yield to the next generation, and then the next generation yielded, and first thing you know, here we are six, seven, eight generations later, and we don't remember any of that history. And so we bought into this Federal Reserve scam, and they're printing money all over again, except they don't print it anymore on, on printing presses. They, they create it through electronic impulses in computers. It's even easier. And they can... They can go to Congress and say, well, we want to, we want to vote for a trillion dollars today or seven trillion dollars today to bail out the banks and the insurance companies and the automobile companies. And all the congressmen have to do is just raise their hand and say, yay. And they don't even have to turn on the printing press. The, the Federal Reserve comes to their aid and just creates the money out of nothing with digital impulses in a computer. I'm here to tell you that you know, the gods of the copybook headings are not going to be fooled. The same mistakes will produce the same results. And we are heading down the path of total disaster right now that will make the experience of the American Revolution or prior or after the American Revolution the, of the colonies, the experience of the debauching the currency and losing purchasing power and having a, a person's wealth completely wiped out. It's going to make that look like... Uh, like a Boy Scout picnic. 
Well, and your book is so completely clear on this topic. I mean, you you talk about how the Federal Reserve System, the fiat mon- the monetary system, they're blatantly unconstitutional. In fact, I'm looking at page 324 of your book, and it says the Constitution prohibits both the states and the federal government from issuing fiat money. So we have Article One, Section Eight, that says that that money must be coined. It cannot be paper. Uh, it never gives ex- it never gives the ability for uh, the Congress to outsource the printing of money, uh, God forbid. But even just the the coining of money, it doesn't allow it to outsource. And we've moved to this place now where the Federal Reserve is basically hijacked, as you've said, uh, the entire system. And so, this is exactly what they faced back then. How many how many central banks has America had since its founding? Well, it's had three altogether. Yeah. This is not the first one. There was one in place actually when the when the uh, country was founded. They got rid of it, and then there was another one came along. And actually, this is number four. Now that I'm thinking about it, and then there was the Bank of North America, and then of course the the big battle against the central bank that uh, we read about in the history books that was waged by um, Andrew Jackson. I mean, he he was the big uh, battler against the banks, and he got rid of the central bank. And, uh, boy, that was an interesting piece of history. It was a, a battle to the finish. And, uh, but the, the central bank was, uh, well, that's the code name for it, it's like the Federal Reserve System. They call it a central bank. It's not a bank, <laughs> but uh, it was a cartel. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is uh, the fourth time. And, uh, and it looks like you know, it's here to stay this time because now the, the bankers really are controlling the government rather than the government controlling the banks. In your book, you uh, brilliantly describe how the Federal Reserve is able to create money out of nothing, as you were talking about, and you call it the Mandrake Mechanism. Can you briefly elaborate on that mechanism and explain how that's been detrimental to the economy? Sure. Uh, I think this is where the rubber meets the road. People must understand how money comes into existence, and it's it's very simple, uh, but um, it's hard to believe it because it is so simple and uh, often there's a tendency for someone to say, but it just doesn't make sense. You mean they're just, uh, they're just making it out of nothing? It doesn't make sense. And the answer is, well, no, it's not supposed to make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's just the way they do it. And uh, once you get the idea clearly in your head that this is a scam, and then you say, oh, well, then it makes sense. But we, we make the mistake of thinking that these people are actually trying to do what is good for the country rather than what is good for the banks. Once we get that uh, mistaken idea out of our heads, then, then it's very clear to understand. Here's how it works. The, um, let's just say that Congress needs some money. And we must remember that this is a partnership now between politicians and bankers. There are two groups of people are working together on this. The banking cartel on the one side and the federal government on the other side, jointly working together for their mutual benefit. So let's just start with Congress, the, the government side, and assume that um, today Congress or the Treasury Department needs another uh, billion dollars by noon. So they don't have it. They're not collecting it in taxes. If they, if they raise the taxes to get that money, they'd be thrown out of office. So they don't want to do that. They uh, want to talk about uh, lowering taxes. But, uh, so they don't have the money. Where do they get it? Well, they'll go to um, the Federal Reserve. And they'll say, well, we need another billion dollars today. Can you lend it to us? The Federal Reserve says, sure, we'll be happy to lend it to you. And they do. They write a check or make an entry in the computer, and the federal government has a, another billion dollars in its account. The question is, though, where did that billion dollars come from? Is it in an account? Did somebody deposit it? No, none of the above. They just create it out of nothing. It's a bookkeeping entry, and it springs into being, and the government now has this, these digits in its uh, checking account, and it can start to write checks against that. The checks go out into the economy, and people cash them, and they buy things with it and so forth. So the money springs into being. And uh, if you and I were to do that, of course, we'd go to jail, but they can do it because the government has authorized them to do it. It's the way in which the government gets easy money. It can get any amount at any time simply by going to the Federal Reserve and saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. That's why those congressmen can raise their hands and and vote uh, benefits 
or awards or stimuluses, whatever you want to call them, or bailouts of $7 trillion at a time and not even have to worry about where the money is coming from because they know it's going to be created out of thin air by the Federal Reserve. But that's just the beginning of the story. Let's just take $1,000 of that uh, billion that was created for the government and follow it. Let's assume that the government gives $1,000 to the person who delivers our mail. The postal worker takes a $1,000 government check down the street and deposits it into his or her private checking account. Now it's out of the government's and Federal Reserve cycle and goes into the commercial banking cycle, the side of this transaction. And this is where the action really heats up. So far, this is just peanuts. Let's see what happens to $1,000 of that billion. This guy deposits it into my bank. Let's say I'm the president of the bank. I can say to everybody, look, <laughs> this guy, uh, this uh, I mean, customer just uh, put $1,000 into my bank, and now I can loan up to $9,000 based on that. And that's true. How, you'd say, how can, how can the bank that got $1,000 deposited into it loan $9,000 and still have $1,000 left in the bank? And that's exactly what happens according to the, uh, the accounting trickery that is authorized by the Federal Reserve. They say, well, the Fed must ha I mean, the banks must have 10% reserves for every dollar they loan. And so we've got $1,000. Let's call that a 10% reserve. So you can loan 9000 and still have 10000 in reserve, or I mean 1000 in reserve. And uh, so where do you get that extra 9000 Well, just write a check on it. Put it out of the computer, create it out of nothing. And that's exactly what the commercial banks do. The money that you borrow from your commercial bank has been created out of nothing. It was not deposited there by someone else. It was created by the bank. And they charge you interest on that. That means you're paying interest on nothing. So it's an incredible uh, scheme. It has worked well for centuries. And one of the reasons they don't really want too many people to understand the system is because they begin to ask questions about how, you know, is this fair, is this right, and so forth. And so that means that for every billion dollars that's created out of nothing by the Federal Reserve for the federal government to spend, up to an additional nine billion can also now be created at the commercial bank level, created out of nothing and pushed into the economy. All of it comes from nothing. And this is a process by which the money supply of the United States and the world is constantly expanding. Now, we do have in the present time some forces that are causing contraction of the money supply. When people pay off their debts or they go bankrupt and are unable to pay their debts, then that money literally goes out of existence, just like it came into existence from nothing in the beginning. Now it goes out of existence, back into nothing. And so it is possible for the money supply to shrink in this process, which, by the way, is, is the primary reason for the big boom-bust cycles that they talk about, the, the, uh, the cycles that cause such economic uh, uh, expansion and contraction and depressions and, and so forth. That's the root of it all. And nevertheless, the, the money supply is, is shrinking at times, and so that's why in times of um, depression or recession like right now, they, uh, they go and try and create more money to compensate for it.